Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Astronomy Off Tap. Uh, this is now our fourth Astronomy Off Tap that we've taken as part of our newly revamped version of Astronomy On Tap Edinburgh that we've currently got online. So a big welcome to everybody. Um, as you might expect, during the ongoing pandemic, we aren't able to hold our traditional live events from the pub. Uh, so instead, we are bringing the universe to you via YouTube. Uh, as I said, this is now our fourth Astronomy Off Tap event. So welcome, everybody. I think it's currently our 20th or 21st Astronomy On Tap in total. So we've been going a little while since 2018. And we have some brilliant speakers for you and activities for you tonight. Um, for anybody who hasn't joined one of our events before, Astronomy on Tap is a, a free event that features accessible, engaging science presentations on topics ranging from planets to black holes to galaxies to the beginning of the universe. Uh, the first AOT event took place in New York a few years ago, I think back in 2014, and it's since spread around the world. Um, tonight we have two speakers. Uh, both with links to Scotland, uh, both present and past. Uh, he'll be talking about different ways in which astronomers investigate what's happening across the universe using different kinds of light and the techniques that they use to do this. Uh, just a reminder that obviously we are now live on YouTube. So if you do have any questions for either of our speakers, please do pop them into the YouTube chat. You can also uh, send us a tweet on Twitter at AOTEDI. Uh, and of course, uh, at the very end of, of our uh, talks tonight, if you do have any suggestions for us for future speakers or future topics, uh, then please do let us know. Uh, you can also tweet us or you can send us comments on the YouTube channel. Uh, so on to our first speaker. So I'll just give you a little bit of background. So our first speaker is uh, Joe Ramasomi, and she is gonna be talking about invisible light. Uh, astronomy across the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so I'll just give you a bit of a brief introduction to Jo. Uh, Jo's a former Edinburgh local who completed her bachelor's in astrophysics at St Andrews before gaining her master's in the same subject at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. Uh, jo is currently working at the University of Hertfordshire doing a PhD in observational extragalactic astrophysics. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, which for all non-astronomers, which includes me, uh, entails using images taken with telescopes both on Earth and in space to study the physics of things outside the Milky Way. Uh, we're not grappling with black holes billions of light years away. You can find Jo in the garden talking to her plants or leading friends, th friends through pen and paper Lovecraftian ventures. Uh, so Jo, if I can ask you to uh, switch over to you and I'll, I'll open with your, your first talk. Brilliant. Yep. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, let me set up my screen share. So I'm going to be talking about uh, invisible light. Uh, thanks for the introduction, John. Um, so when I say invisible light, um, it's a, a kind of, I suppose, a, a silly way of saying uh, all of the, the light that we can't see with our eyes across the electromagnetic spectrum. So I'm going to start by just talking about what visible light is, um, then talk about uh, the range of other kinds of light we can study, some of the ways that we can, we can observe this invisible light, um, and then how I use invisible light to study supermassive black holes um, through my PhD. Um, I've been using uh, observations from a range of different telescopes at different wavelengths. Um, so I'll talk about just a few of them and how we can pull that information together to learn something about the physics of what's going on um, in supermassive black holes really, really far away. So, first of all, uh, visible light, which we're all familiar with, um, is all of the light across the, the visible spectrum. So from the longest wavelengths, um, lowest energy light uh, being the reddest light, um, all the way up to higher energy, um, short wavelength light um, in the blue. Um, and this visible light is electromagnetic radiation, but just a very small part of the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation um, across a range of energies. So if we put this in context, we have the visible light at the, the very middle of the spectrum here. Um, and we can see as we go to higher energies, um, so we go to the to the right, we go uh, to higher energies, we get to ultraviolet radiation, just beyond the visible and optical wavelengths. 
Um, even higher energies, we get to X rays and finally gamma rays. And as we go down to lower wavelengths um, and lower energy, sorry, longer wavelengths and lower energy, and we go from the optical to the infrared, which is tracing kind of warm things in the universe, down through the submillimeter and all the way down to the radio. Um, and so all of these different types of emission are electromagnetic radiation. The vast majority of what we can learn about space um, comes from electromagnetic radiation that we can detect here on Earth. There are some exceptions, um, but up until recently, it was really just electromagnetic radiation. Um, of course, astronomy isn't an experimental science. You can't go out and scoop out a bit of a galaxy and see what it's made of. We just have to, to learn as much as we can from the light um, across the whole energy spectrum uh, to, to piece together information of, about the physical processes. Um, and the real benefit of being able to probe these different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum is that they're probing different uh, ranges of energies. So we can look at very high energy processes and then using uh, different wavelengths of light, we can look at very low energy processes. Um, and put together um, a kind of schematic of, of the different kinds of energetic processes in the universe. So here are a few of the telescopes that we can use to, to do this. So this is just a handful I've picked out, I guess, some of the most famous. Um, arguably, I suppose, depends who you ask, some of the best telescopes for looking at these different wavelengths of light. So in the visible light, um, we have the the telescopes that produce the images that we're probably most familiar with, um, things like Hubble, um, so the Hubble Space Telescope, which is um, has now been going for, for more than two decades, um, taking these incredible images in the optical um, of, of a range of different kinds of objects in space. And so this is, um, this is the, the kind of very, very beautiful images that we're, we're most familiar with, I think. Um, I'll show some pictures at different wavelengths in a moment. Um, but that only gives us part of the picture. So then if we go down to lower wavelengths, let's say into the infrared, we can use telescopes like Herschel. So Herschel is another space telescope um, that imaged, it's actually, uh, its lifetime is over now, but it imaged the infrared sky. So looked at the dust and warm things in the universe. So I use, I use Herschel um, data in some of my work. Um, you can see that a lot of the telescopes on this diagram are in space. So for certain wavelengths, we want to get above the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so for example, X-ray. So let's go to the high energies. Chandra um, over on the left of the diagram is um, an X-ray telescope that again, it's been going for 20 years, taking images of the very high energy sky. Of course, on the Earth, um, our atmosphere doesn't let X-ray light uh, pass through. So X-ray photons from space don't reach us here on Earth, which is good for us. Uh, because we wouldn't want X-ray photons hitting us. Um, but it's bad for X-ray astronomy. So you need to put something out above the Earth's atmosphere um, to be able to detect that very high energy radiation from space. There are some wavelengths that we can detect from the Earth. So obviously here we've got Keck at the bottom, um, which is another optical light telescope, um, which in a very clear, uh, clear location, so on the top of a mountain with as little atmosphere to disturb the image as pos possible, uh, you, can, you can obtain very, very good images from the ground in the optical. But there are some parts, um, like I said, where, where, where we can't observe. Um, so as we go to infrared, again, the atmosphere blocks most of the infrared radiation uh, from space. So we need to put telescopes above the atmosphere. You can see that the other ground-based telescopes here um, are actually combinations of multiple instruments. So as we go down to submillimeter and radio, um, we have uh, interferometers, which are essentially tying together lots of radio, lots of telescopes um, to act as one very large telescope. And these give us very, very high resolution images. Um, so we can see things in, in a lot of detail. Um, I, I haven't actually had the, the luck to use telescopes like uh, ALMA is probably the world-class submillimeter um, telescope facility. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to use it, but I'm gonna be talking a bit about the other submillimeter um, observations that I've used in a moment. So let's see, what can we see in these different wavelengths of light? So this is the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest neighbor galaxy. 
two and a half billion light years away. Um, and you can see here, this is, this is maybe an image um, a lot of people will be familiar with of um, Andromeda, beautiful spiral galaxy. Um, and here we're just looking at the optical light, the visible light. So what we can see is the light from stars. Um, you can see a bright bulge in the center of the galaxy. And you can see these dark rings around it where the dust lanes um, are blocking that visible light. So um, the light from the stars is being absorbed um, and blocked by that dust. If we start to look in other wavelengths, we get completely different information. So here is the Andromeda galaxy across the electromagnetic spectrum. As we go down to infrared, instead of seeing the, the starlight, what we're seeing is the, the cooler emission, the lower energy emission that comes from dust. So dust is heated up by stars and it kind of re-radiates um, this warm glow, which we can detect in the infrared. As we go down to submillimeter, we start to detect even colder dust. So very, very cold, very low temperatures um, that we can detect in this very long wavelength radiation. And as we go down to the radio, we're not detecting thermal emission at all, but start to detect um, gas. Um, if we go up to higher energies, so from the optical, we go higher to ultraviolet, uh, you can see here we're only detecting the very, very hottest things. So the very hottest stars, young stars that have just been formed um, that are radiating at very high energies. And as we go to X-ray, we start to detect much more exotic kinds of things. Um, and then into the gamma ray, uh, this, this image is not very, not, not as high resolution as the others. We can just see a kind of blob, um, but we see there's this, this, this blob of very high energy emission coming from the center of the galaxy. So one thing um, that we can that we can use uh, that, that we can do with 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 these different types of light um, probing different parts of the energy spectrum um, is is observe different parts of the galaxy um, that would be obscured to us if we were to just use optical light. So on the left here, well, both of these pictures are of the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And on the left, we're looking at um, an image in visible light. So again, you can see um, all of the, the starlight, um, but you can also see these very, very dark patches, which are um, just as before in Andromeda, they're the dust. Um, and that's blocking a lot of the, the light uh, from stars behind the dust. So we can't see what's, what's, what's behind those regions that are obscured by dust. Whereas if we look in the infrared, that longer wavelength light cuts right through the dust so we can see beyond to the stars behind it. So on the right here, we have this um, very same region of the Milky Way galaxy um, imaged in the infrared. One really, really interesting application of, of this using infrared light to cut through dust and look at what's behind um, is this obs observation of the very center of our Milky Way. So I hope this video works. Um, I'll play it in a moment, but this is uh, a video taken, well, a video made by combining lots and lots of observations over several years. So in the top corner, you can see um, the year, um, which will tick forward as we go through. Um, so by putting all those observations together, we make a video um, that spans several years of the stars at the very center of our Milky Way. And we can see um, their orbital paths as they move around the center of the Milky Way. So if I play this video, So as you can see, um, we're going forward in time and we can see the movement of these stars. And if we zoom in, now the, the orbits of those stars are being traced out. And you can see that, so that one in the center loops around very quickly, if I play it again, um, that star in the center loops, loops around um, the, the point in this video where there's that yellow cross. Now there's nothing there at that point where there's the yellow cross. There's no star, there's no light, we can't see anything. But we know that because the stars are moving around it because they're orbiting it and we can, we can use their orbital paths to work out the, the mass of the object they must be orbiting. We know that there is something there that's very, very massive and very dark. And I'll come on to the significance of that in a moment. But just another example now of uh, multi-wavelength astronomy giving us a, a whole lot more information than we would have just from the visible. Here's a, a visible light image of a patch of sky. 
um, an extra galactic patch of sky. So looking outside of our own galaxy into the distant universe. And we can see lots and lots of galaxies in this image. Um, so all of these blobs are, are galaxies. Um, and then in the center, that kind of large fuzzy blob is a rather unassuming looking elliptical galaxy. Um, so in the visible light, that's what we can see. We can see the stellar emission, um, this very normal looking galaxy. If we add the radio emission um, that we see from this galaxy, we can immediately see that something very different is going on. This is not a normal galaxy just with stars doing their thing. Um, there's something else going on here. Um, these huge radio jets extend way beyond the extent of the galaxy that we can see in the visible light. And then if we add the X-ray emission, we can also see that there's something very high energy going on around this galaxy too. So what could be causing these very extreme kinds of radiation in both the low energy and the high energy? It's supermassive black holes. So what is a supermassive black hole? Well, a black hole um, is a very, very well. So I'm going to present this from an observational point of view. As, as John said in my introduction, um, I'm an observational astronomer. I'm not a theoretician. So I'm sure a theoretician would give you a very different description of a black hole. Um, I kind of simply uh, understand black holes um, from what we can observe of them. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, a black hole is a very, very dense uh, region of space it's where there's a, an incredible amount of matter crushed down into a very small area, very small volume. Um, and the most common place that we find them is at the end of a massive star's lifetime. So when a giant star runs out of hydrogen to burn, um, becomes unstable, the core will collapse into this very, very dense object. And if it's massive enough, it will become a black hole. Um, and we know about lots of these black holes um, across, across the universe, uh, but a supermassive black hole is, is a whole other beast entirely. We still don't know exactly how they form. We just know that we find them at the centers of galaxies. Um, and to give you a sense of the, the scales involved um, and how bizarre these objects are, um, I've got some comparisons here. So in terms of the size scales of a supermassive black hole, um, they're not that big spatially. So a supermassive black hole is maybe a few light hours across. So that means it would take like only a few hours to travel from one side to the other. And they're at the centers of galaxies, which are up to 100,000 light years across. So much, much larger. And in size scales, as a comparison, that's equivalent to a grain of sand relative to the whole planet Earth. So they're very, very small spatially. If we look at the mass, things start to get a bit crazier. So a supermassive black hole might have a mass um, a billion times the mass of the sun compared to the galaxy that it lives in, which has a mass of around a thousand billion um, suns. That's equivalent to the mass of all of the Earth's oceans relative to the Earth. So now we're thinking if we had a, a black hole the size of a grain of sand, it would have the mass of all of the Earth's oceans. And then if we look at the, the energy that a black hole could potentially um, give out, um, the energy uh, that a, a black hole relative to its galaxy could, could, could produce is equivalent to 100 billion billion of the most powerful nuclear bombs relative to the Earth. So that's enough energy to destroy the Earth 20 times over, or for a, for a black hole, enough e energy to destroy its host galaxy 20 times over. Now, of course, this doesn't happen. If it did happen, we wouldn't see any galaxies out there. Um, energy can be produced by a supermassive black hole as material falls into it. So they're incredibly massive, incredibly dense. Um, they have a phenomenal gravitational potential, um, which if as an object falls towards the center of a black hole, it will lose that gravitational potential energy. And that's where this energy is coming from. They're the most powerful sources of energy in the universe, much more powerful than the nuclear fusion that goes on in the centers of stars, which makes them some of the brightest objects in the universe. So it's not the black hole itself, but stuff falling into a black hole and releasing that gravitational potential energy um, burns an, among the, the brightest objects in the universe. So we can see them to very, very great distances. Black holes are not always um, swallowing up material like this. So when we have, we, when we look at, at the galaxies 
in the universe, um, as far as we have been able to measure, all massive galaxies have a supermassive black hole at the center. They don't all look like this though. Um, if a supermassive black hole is switched on um, and is swallowing up material and producing this incredible amount of energy, um, we say it's, it's active, it's an active galactic nucleus. Um, so that's the, the switched on black hole at the center of a galaxy. But we also know quite a lot of the time they seem to be switched off. So the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, our galaxy, is not an active galactic nucleus. It's switched off at the moment. How and why they are switched on or off is still very much something we're trying to understand, how frequently they switch on and off, um, what triggers them switching on and off. Um, that's partly uh, one of the things I've been looking at through my PhD. So again, if we take this electromagnetic spectrum, um, let me show you which parts of the spectrum I use in particular. Um, I, use, I use observations across the whole spectrum, but there are two parts of the spectrum that are particularly interesting to me. And that's the submillimeter, the very cool emission from very cold things, um, and the X-ray, the very high energy emission from very, very high energy processes. So the submillimeter emission I'm looking at um, comes from dust, comes from dust that's just been heated up very gently um, by newly formed stars. And so this, this cool dust just slightly warmed up um, radiates this very low energy, long, wave, long wavelength radiation in the submillimeter. The X-ray comes from supermassive black holes. So when they're swallowing up material um, in this very, very high energy process, they produce a phenomenal amount of X-ray radiation. And if we take an image of the X-ray sky, um, all of the, the points that we can see outside of our galaxy are supermassive black holes that are swallowing material. So here are the instruments that I use. So this is Chandra, the space telescope I mentioned earlier. Um, I think it's, it's, it's the best X-ray telescope out there. Um, and it's been taking images of the high energy sky for 20 years. So here's an example picture. So all of the blobs here um, are supermassive black holes swallowing material. This is just a patch of sky. Um, and this is all the information we get, just those, those blobs of high energy X-ray radiation. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, at the very low wave, uh, low energy, long wavelength, submillimeter emission, um, I use the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, which is on the top of Mauna Kea. Um, it's a huge telescope collecting this very long wavelength light. You need an incredibly large mirror. Um, so you can see in the bottom left hand corner, um, there's a car, which gives you a sense of the scale um, of this instrument. Um, and this is what an image from the James from the James Clark Maxwell Telescope looks like. So this is the submillimeter sky. Um, it's very fuzzy. Um, I'd say a, an alternative title for my thesis would be the the science of fuzzy blobs. I'm still working on it, but it's definitely been uh, a PhD with a lot of fuzzy blobs. Um, every bright fuzzy blob that you can see here um, is a galaxy that's forming lots of stars. So as it forms those stars, the stars warm up the dust and the dust radiates the submillimeter emission. And that's what we can detect in this image. So not as glamorous perhaps as optical images of you know, the Andromeda galaxy, but also very useful to pull out information about these very different processes going on. So here's a picture um, of a very nearby galaxy that's similar to the kinds of galaxies I study. Um, and we can see this is a composite image using both the, the visible light. So we can see that in, in the white um, light in this picture. Then the X-ray has also been put on top in the blue. Um, so that's labeled, uh, so that's the very high energy emission coming from the supermassive black hole in this galaxy. And then the lowest energy submillimeter light um, is also marked in a kind of reddish color. And that shows the emission from the dust in this galaxy. So the galaxies I study are um, 10 billion light years away. Um, they tell us about when the universe was about half of the age that it is now. Um, they do not look like this. They look like the fuzzy blobs I showed you a minute ago. Um, but this image is really useful because I think it illustrates what's going on a bit more clearly. So we have the supermassive black hole producing this very high energy emission the dust from stars producing this very low energy emission. What's the connection? So 
one theory, uh, well, the, the main theory of how galaxies, um, how galaxies grow and evolve uh, is, I think we're going to hear more about, more about that in simulations later from Juan. Um, the, the, the models that we have for, for growing galaxies in the universe work very well up to a point, um, and then we need to stop galaxies from growing too big. And the mechanism that's put into the models um, to, to, to stop galaxies from growing is supermassive black holes. The idea is they blast out this very um, phenomenal amount of energy um, and shut down star formation in the galaxy and stop it from growing too large. But we don't really have very good observational evidence that this is happening. Um, so that's what uh, my PhD project was, was setting out to look for, is the, the observational signature of supermassive black holes swallowing up material, switching on, blasting out energy through the galaxies and shutting down star formation. So I looked at the, uh, the high energy radiation from the X-ray to, to measure how powerful a supermassive black hole is, how much energy it's able to blast out through its galaxy. And then I looked at the submillimeter to measure how much star formation was going on with the hypothesis that if we have a very powerful X-ray emitting um, supermassive black hole, we would expect to see less star formation as the, the supermassive black hole is, is stopping the stars from being formed. So I, when I saw a lot of X-ray, I expected to see um, little submillimeter emission. Um, and what I hoped to do was measure a range of different powers of supermassive black holes from, from, low, uh, from low amounts of X-ray emission to high amounts of X-ray emission, and to look for whether there is a trend um, in the submillimeter that tells us about star formation. Um, and what we would expect, which is that there is less submillimeter emission where there is more X-ray emission, is not at all what we found. We actually found no difference um, in the submillimeter emission, so in the amount of star formation going on in a galaxy um, relative to the power of the AGN, the, the supermassive black hole at its center. Um, so we couldn't find any examples, or we couldn't find a, 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 a consistent um, picture with the explanation that supermassive black holes are shutting down star formation in the galaxies that host them. Um, and I think finding the opposite of what you're expecting to find in, in astrophysics is quite exciting. Um, while you can't write it up very neatly and say, oh, we've solved the problem, it does show us there's an awful lot more that we still need to understand. There's a lot of physics here that we still really don't have a good grip on. Um, and uh, lots of limitations in terms of uh, the instruments that we have and the information that we're able to pull out from these very distant objects. So that's everything I wanted to, to talk about. Um, I would love to answer any questions um, that I think there will be time later to do so. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. That was that was fantastic. That was a really, really interesting talk. Thank you so much for going over those. We do have a few questions from our audience uh, to put to you, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so we've got some coming through. So uh, first question is just talking about supermassive black holes. So in order of magnitude, so what would typical pressure be like compared to say a neutron star? So a neutron star is the, the other potential endpoint for a very massive star. So when a massive star runs out of fuel, its core collapses, depending on the mass that's left over in that core, um, it could collapse to either form a neutron star or a black hole. So a black hole would be the, the denser of the two options. So, um, so a neutron star is less, less dense than a supermassive black hole. Um, in terms of the physics of what's going on inside, I can't really comment because I don't, I don't know. Um, and it very much depends on, on your theoretical framework. Um, in fact, even the nature of neutron stars isn't particularly well understood. Um, but that, I mean, that's really not my area of expertise. But when, when you get into a black hole um, and the physics of what's going on inside a black hole, um, things start to get very crazy very quickly. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. And some, I think some of these questions, obviously your background is, is looking at observational like, uh, astrophysics. And some of these might touch more on the theory, but I think yeah. you're, you're a fantastic resource for some of this anyway. So some of this might touch on that. Um, there was a few sort of people asking about uh, the, the theory that the supermassive black holes switch on and off. So do you have any kind of uh, insight into, into why that is? Like, What's the theory behind that? So 
Um, when, a, when a supermassive black hole is switched on, when it's an active galactic nucleus, all that means is it's swallowing a material. So there's got to be stuff there um, for it to swallow up. So let's say gas, um, there has to be enough gas around and it has to get close enough to the black hole to start falling into its gravitational potential. So while I said that, I mean, we talked about the, the, the size scales and the mass scales um, and the energy scales, um, most of the stuff in a galaxy doesn't know about the supermassive black hole at its center. So from where we are on the Earth around the sun, relative to the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, we don't feel its gravitational potential at all. We just feel the gravitational potential of all of the other stars um, and gas and dust and stuff um, inside of the galaxy um, than us. Um, so you actually have to get pretty close to a black hole to, to start to feel its effects gravitationally. Um, and that's difficult, actually getting material in right to the center of the black hole, um, where right to the center of the galaxy, sorry, um, close enough to the black hole to start falling in and, and producing this energy is, is not straightforward. Um, so, so you have to have some kind of mechanism for funneling stuff uh, towards the center of the galaxy. Um, and we don't know exactly what that might be. We don't know. Um, one thing that could provoke it is if you have a, a merger of galaxies, so two galaxies merge together, you suddenly get a lot of um, a lot of stuff happening with with gas kind of smashing into other gas and and uh, I'm not not describing this very scientifically, but um, once you start smashing stuff together, then you can you can knock it out of a kind of nice equilibrium and start to move things around, and so that can cause star formation to start. So you you, you create shocks. Which can, which can produce star formation, um, but can also perhaps trigger a, a supermassive black hole to start swallowing up material. Um, yeah, it, it's, there are AGN, sorry, there are active galactic nuclei that, that seem to switch on and off, um, that they, they change. Um, again, this might be something that we're gonna learn a lot more uh, uh, from someone who knows a bit more about this in a bit. Oh, it's fun. And thank you so much for, for using the word smash it all together, which makes non-experts like me feel much better and be like, oh, this is what that means. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's in terms of so just in terms of you talking about um, AGM, which is active galactic nuclei. Um, and there was a question I was talking a little bit about, and I think this will probably go to, to Juan later on as well, because it's a really interesting topic. But given the gravitational potential is, is presumably still there, what does it mean for and you kind of answered this a little bit already, but what does it mean for galactic nuclei to be on or off? Um, so it's just, that's really an observational definition. And actually when you get down to it, um, it, it just depends. We don't know exactly what's going on. We know what we can see. Um, and when we can see very, very bright um, X-ray emission, we know that there's a lot of energy coming out. We know there must be a lot of stuff falling in. Um, when you say it, it, it switched off, um, you know, it just falls below some threshold at which we can't detect it anymore. We can't see it. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what's going on. There, it could be kind of, a, you know, a, a clump of gas comes along and falls in and it kind of wakes up for a bit and then kind of goes back down again. Um, they can vary on very short time scales. The amount of emission that we see can vary on, you know, we're talking years you can see huge variation in a few years which in galaxy time scales is nothing at all you know um so but in terms of switching on and off you're talking much longer time scales i'm not sure i'm not sure if that, yeah i hope that makes sense yeah no that's a great answer thank you very much and then uh there's, there's a couple of well, slightly, slightly more difficult ones but, but in terms of if we talk about a supermassive black hole being sort of 10 billion light years away how how do we know that? Like how and, and how do we determine in terms of what accuracy do we know that sort of distance? Sure. Um, so when you start talking about distances on these scales, um, you have to start making definitions about what what distance is, what kind of distance you're talking about. Um, and the way that when I say 10 billion light, light years, uh, what I mean is we can I guess it's more accurate to say not, not how far away you're looking, but how far back are you looking? What part of history of the universe are you looking at? And that we can tell from, from redshift. Um, so we know the universe is expanding. Um, we know that the further away you look, um, the faster it is expanding. Um, so by looking at how fast a galaxy is moving away from us, uh, we can tell more or less how far away it is or, or how, how far back in time we're looking into the history of the universe. Um, so the universe is about 14 billion years old um, and 
the galaxies I'm looking at are from kind of um, when the universe was about half as old as it is now, so seven billion years old, I guess. Um, and and so we get this this redshift of of light as as the galaxy is moving um, away from us. Um, the light that comes from that galaxy is, is stretched out. Um, this is a very hand wavy way of explaining it, literally. Um, the light is kind of stretched out, um, and it, it 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 goes to longer wavelengths um, as as it gets stretched out. Um, so the light becomes redder and lower energy. Um, so if we can identify something in the galaxy, we know the wavelength of light that that it should be. Um, so, for example, um, a transition, em, em, an emission line from an, from an at atomic transition, and we know exactly the wavelength that should happen at, and we observe it at a different wavelength, we can look at the difference between those wavelengths and work out how much the light has been stretched. So, therefore, how fast the galaxy is moving away, and therefore, how far away it is. Um, but a whole bunch of theory has to be rolled into that as well. That's brilliant. And then just just one last question while we got it. So I think with a lot of the work you do is obviously based around sort of observation and, and some of the you showed some great examples of some of the technology and some of the satellites and some of the stations that you've used in the past. And that must take a lot of a lot of high tech equipment, and a lot of participation and a lot of partnership work. How has that been affected during the pandemic? Have you found that's just has it all stopped? Has it been more difficult? Have you found you have more time to look at the sky? Like how has how has it all affected you? Um. So as a PhD student, um, sadly, I don't spend that much time actually looking at the sky. In fact, I haven't been out to look at, a, to, look at to, to use a telescope at all through my PhD. All of the data that I've used is out there already. It's all on the internet. You can download it at home, you know, figure out stuff about black holes. Uh, anyone can do it. Um, of course, there are still people who are relying on, on uh, observations. I'm just not one of them, I suppose. So I'm very lucky, I suppose, that the pandemic hasn't affected me personally, but it does definitely has had a huge impact on um, the kinds of work that we can do. A lot of telescope facilities were closed for a certain period of time. Some of them are starting to open. It depends on, on the facilities and where they are. Um, uh, and a lot of observing can be done remotely. So even if you know I can't fly to Hawaii just now to go and use a telescope, I could potentially um, use it online or somebody else can can control it for me if that makes sense um i don't know i haven't i haven't really i don't think i don't have any exciting stories about how my work's been i think one of the great things that makes us very fortunate um as astronomers is that we can keep doing a lot of the work um i don't need to go into a lab i don't rely on anything alive to to keep on going um all of all of that stuff is still out there and waiting for us to watch so yeah oh that's brilliant that's my non-expert question at the end we get all the interesting ones at the start that relate to that and then we have the non-expert one tagged on the end <laughs> that was brilliant um fantastic thank you so much Joe. that was a really great thank talk you. i really appreciate you coming on thank you um so we've now reached the part uh, of the event uh, where we're going to hand over to our, our resident games master uh, who is rachel uh, for today so rachel i'm going to uh, to turn off my camera and i'll hand over to you well, good evening, um, or insert appropriate um, greeting for your time zone. Um, this is normally the part of the evening where we take a little bit of a break, give the brains a bit of a rest before the next talk, um, but I'm not going to do that. That would be too easy. Um, tonight, we're going to attempt a quiz. Um, so like a lot of events that have had to go virtual, we have been struggling with how to do a live quiz. And so this is an experiment. And so I ask you to please play along, even if you don't think you're going to do very well or everything helps. Um, we just want to know if this works. So what you need to do is go to the web address on your screen, which hopefully one of my glamorous assistants will post in the YouTube chat as well. So you can just click on it. This is bit.ly slash AOT quiz, um, all lowercase. I think it cares about that. Um, preferably on another device, if you happen to have a smartphone or something with you, um, so you can still see the screen, that would be great. Um, we're going to try and replicate the live in-person quiz experience by having the questions on screen, and then you submit your answers, preferably on another screen. But if you do have to flip back and forth between two tabs, that's also fine. Um, when you go to that link, I'm going to just talk for a bit to give you time to do that. Um, when you go to that link, it will take you to a form um, on the first page. It just has like name, location, email address. You can fill that in if you want to. Um, if you want to win a prize, then you will need to fill that in because I need to contact you and ask for your address. That is the only thing I will do with your email address. If you don't win, I'll ignore it. 
Um, if you are not interested in winning a prize, you can leave all that blank and be anonymous and then you won't be embarrassed. I'm not going to read out who gets zero anyway. Um, there is a prize. I mentioned there's a prize. So the prize tonight is a, um, a copy of one of my favourite popular science books um, called Mapping the Heavens. This is by Priya Natarajan, um, who is a professor at Yale University studying black holes. It's very relevant. Um, this book is about um, how we have figured things out about space. This is one of my favorite topics in astronomy. It's just how do you go about figuring out things that you can't touch? And the creativity that goes into thinking up ways of, as we heard in the last talk, measuring distance, um, using different times of, types of light to investigate different parts of the universe. Um, this is a very really engaging um, deep dive into how we've worked out um, things about the universe. So mapping where things are, how far away they are. Um, it's also signed by the author. Um, so fantastic prize available there. And I will post it anywhere in the world. Um, all you have to do is enter your email address there and I will contact the winner as we're done. Um, so hopefully that has given you enough time to load up the quiz form. Um, the way this is going to work is I'm going to put the questions on screen you are going to hold off pressing next, which I'm hoping you've done because you read the instructions um, until I have read out the question. Once I've read out the question, press next. You will have 30 seconds to answer, uh, but there are points for answering more quickly. So this is to discourage Googling because I can't watch you. Um, the more quickly you answer, um, the more points you'll score. Um, you will then go to a holding page for the next question. So wait for me to read out the next question, then press next again. And hopefully this is going to keep us all in sync, um, given that there is a delay in live streaming. So you're not all watching this at the exact same time, which is the problem we're trying to overcome. Um, so let's move on to the first question. There are only eight questions. Um, they are based on the talk we've just heard or what I assumed that talk would be about given only the title. Um, so hopefully if you are paying attention, you'll stand a good chance um, of being in with a shot at winning this prize. With no further ado, question one, what is the name of this telescope facility which is located in Chile? Um, we have a picture here showing four telescopes sitting on a desert mountain in Chile. Your options are A, the large telescope, B, the very large telescope, C, the extremely large telescope, or D, the overwhelmingly large telescope and your 30 seconds start now. Um, this question may or may not be a little dig at how rubbish astronomers are at naming things because really none of these should be an option, should they? They are all quite pathetic names for a telescope. Um, believe this one may have been mentioned in the previous talk, possibly not. It was maybe shown, um, but this is um, one that I made a lot of use of during my PhD. So I'm sure you all remember watching a talk of mine, in which case you can answer that no problem. So it takes us on to question two. In April 2019, this image of a black hole imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope was released. Which galaxy hosts this black hole? Um, our options are M87, B, the Milky Way, C, Andromeda, or D, NGC 5194. And that's your 30 seconds starting now. These are all real galaxies. And um, if you're paying attention to the last talk, you'll probably know that they all have a supermassive black hole in the middle, but which one um, did we take a picture of? We, I had nothing to do with this. Um, that's actually a mark of honor because most of the astronomers in the world, I think were, had something to do with this, not me. Um, question three, the left-hand image is the Whirlpool galaxy seen in optical wavelengths. What wavelength is shown on the right? So if you're paying attention to the last talk, you may be able to work this out. Our options are A, radio, B, infrared, C, x-ray, or D, gamma ray. Um, the image we're looking at um, shows the same general shape as the optical image, but focused on lots of very small bright blobs. Um, there's your clue for answering this one. That's half the time gone. Final 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. 
Question four. What is thought to power the luminous central regions of some galaxies known as active galactic nuclei? And we have an image of a jet coming out of one of them there. Um, option A is merging neutron stars, B, supermassive black holes, C, exploding stars, or D, comets colliding with planets. So these are the bright central regions in the middle of galaxies. Um, you may have heard, them to, heard of them referred to as AGN or active galactic nuclei. Um, what is it that we think powers those active galactic nuclei and produces those huge jets? Question five, what wavelengths does ALMA observe? So this um, was mentioned in the last talk. Your options are A, X-ray, B, ultraviolet, C, optical, or D, radio. Um, what is the best of those four options? Um, this is um, one of the like, best world-class facilities for this particular wavelength. Um, if you happen to know what the terrible acronym is, that definitely helps. Um, also located in Chile, um, a lot of fantastic telescopes down there in Chile. Question six. What is often described as the missing link between stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes? We have A, superstellar mass black holes, B, intermediate mass black holes, C, massive black holes, or D, fairly massive black holes. Again, maybe a little bit of a dig at how rubbish astronomers are at naming things because something as cool as a black hole should not have a boring name. It is, however, a descriptive name. And if you're paying attention to the news, um, this one has come up in the news at some point within the last few months. Question seven, which of the following wavelengths must be observed from space? A, optical, B, near infrared, C, far infrared, or D, radio? Um, now, of course, you can observe any of these um, from space in theory, um, but one of them must be observed from space. Um, which one is that? If you recognize the telescope in the image, that might give you a bit of a clue. If you recognize that telescope, I'm guessing you already know the answer to this, though. Question eight, what is the name of the supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way? Is it A, Sagittarius A star, B, Taurus A star, C, Scorpius A star, and D, Aries A star? Um, no clue in the image here, that's just an artist's impression of any old black hole. Um, I've given you the A star, so do you know whereabouts in the sky it is? That might be a clue. I don't know constellations, so that's not a clue to me. Okay, and that is it. Your torment is over. Um, the system will tell you your score and how many questions you got right, um, but stay tuned. And after the second talk, we will go through the answers and um, let you know if you won. Um, if you have any um, feedback about that system for doing quizzes, pretending we're in sync when we're not really, um, then please do put that in the YouTube chat or let us know on Twitter. This is all useful information. Right. Thank you. I'll hand it back over to John. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I, I'm embarrassed to say I did take part in that in that quiz, but I won't reveal my score because it's uh, it's embarrassing. But anyway, uh, yeah, thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, so this is uh, we're now going to move on to our second and final uh, talk of the evening. 
so we have Dr. Juan Hernandez and Santisteban, uh, who's going to talk about echo mapping of supermassive black holes. So uh, Juan is an engineer astronomer originally hailing from Mexico. Uh, his undergraduate degree was in mechanical engineering at UNAM in Mexico City, with a particular focus on astronomical instrumentation. He then pursued uh, an MSc in astronomy at UNAM's uh, Institute of Astronomy and later moved to the UK, where he re received his PhD at the University of Southampton under the supervision of uh, Professor Christian Nigg. Uh, a stint moved uh, at the University of Amsterdam followed, where he was a postdoctoral researcher working on compact objects in a low level accretion regime, which took me about five minutes to say. I think it's COLA for short. Uh, and he's currently uh, working as a research fellow at the University of St Andrews, so just up the road from Edinburgh, uh, where his work mainly focuses on multi wavelength observations of accreting compact objects in active galactic nuclei, which we very uh, fitting for the previous talk, uh, focusing on X-rays, ultraviolet, optical, and infrared. I said all of that without even getting any spelling mistakes. So, uh, Juan, if you're there, I will I'll hand over to you. Yes, thank you very much, John, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Mm. All right. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, staying on in this Astronomy on Tap. Uh, yeah, my name is Juan, uh, and I'm a research fellow at St. Andrews. And hopefully today I can talk to you about a very interesting topic, which I'm working currently on echo mapping of supermassive black holes, um, which is, uh, I really love this, this very nice uh, artist rendition of one of them, quite scientifically accurate. Um, Right, so I would, I would like to start with the big picture. And here I'd like to uh, thank Jo for her very good introduction to multi-wavelength astronomy and, and galaxies in particular. Um, so this, you've probably seen this, uh, if you ever seen a textbook of, uh, of astronomy, this is the, one of the deep fields. This is the extreme deep field from the Hubble Space Telescope. So this, this is a, this is a, a snapshot of a very, very small patch of the sky, a very a blank patch of the sky at the start. But after taking an image of over 20, uh, of over a few months, uh, it turns out that that blank patch of the sky, it actually reveals around 5,500 galaxies. So every single uh, object that you observe here, all everything here is a galaxy that it, it's an object that is not in our galaxy. It's everything is extra galactic. Um, and, Today, and today, what I would like to talk to you about is uh, the uh, of how the how the supermassive black holes that reside at the center of every single point, as every single galaxy that you see here, how do they interact with their with with their neighborhood, with the galaxy that it resides in, um, and and why is that? Because so one of the things that we have learned throughout the, throughout the last decades is that gal that galaxies and the supermassive black hole at its core, uh, they evolve uh, together. They co-evolve throughout throughout cosmic time. So here you have a super cool uh, simulation uh, from the Illustri from the Illustris team uh, that shows a patch of uh, a, uh, of simulated universe. Uh, so you see the gas uh, colliding just by its own gravity into these filaments. And eventually this, at the nodes, at the intersection of these filaments, stars start to be created and eventually galaxies. And at some point galaxies start exploding and some of the material actually can reach the, the supermassive black hole in its center. Uh, when it does that material can funnel into the black hole and part of that material can also reach uh, uh, through these like humongous and very bright and energetic jets to the outskirts of the galaxy, interacting not only with our galaxy, but with the material that it's, that it's all around us. Um, and this is all very interesting because as, as Joe mentioned already, uh, the feedback between the supermassive black hole and its galaxy, it can allow to make more stars or stop making more stars. So we, in order to understand how our universe becomes uh, looks as it does now, we need to understand how these supermassive black holes uh, grow, how do the material actually funnels in through, um, and how it actually evolves, so how this massive black hole uh, um, uh, grows throughout, throughout this time. So this, and this is exactly how we, 
if, if we look through a telescope or through our Hubble deep field, this is what we look like. But this is really the, the end point of, of a lot of different processes uh, as we look back in time. So the main question that I really wanna tackle today is a very simple one. It's just how do black holes feel? In particular, how do supermassive black holes at the center of, of most galaxies uh, feed themselves? Um, and when, uh, so when these massive, uh, so supermassive black holes start feeding, uh, they become from this quiescent and very low level activity black hole into this active galactic nucleus or AGN. They're also sometimes known as quasars. Uh, nowadays, those two, were, those two terms are interchangeable. So we sometimes AGN, quasars, uh, uh, you can choose however you wanna call them. Um, so in this particular example, we have one uh, relatively close by galaxy uh, that Rachel has already previewed uh, in, during the quiz. So you probably at least know one of the answers of the quiz. So this galaxy is uh, M87. Uh, it's a huge elliptical galaxy. And if you just see the galaxy, it would just be a boring blob in the sky. However, this one in particular has an incredible feature. So if you look coming out from the center of the galaxy, you have this fantastic jet uh, that streams, oh, previewing that. Uh, that streams out from the center of the, uh, of, the, of the galaxy. And in particular, it actually comes from the, from the black hole at the center of that galaxy. So if we try to zoom in, what we think is happening is something like this. So this is a simulation with all the physics that you can think of, special relativity, hydrodynamics, magnetism, everything. And just try to see how a black hole like M87 would, would work. So you would see that the feeding is actually, it's, it's a feeding frenzy. So there's material, material going in and around the black hole, but there's a particular structure in the middle, right? So not material just plunges into it. So in fact, this material organizes itself into a flat thin disk around the black hole, sort of like a pancake-like structure that rotates with the black hole. Um, and this is how the, how the material that is just fluffing around actually organizes itself as it's going into the, as it's going into the black hole into this disk and it's it and it's it keeps going closer and closer and closer to the disk a lot of that material actually plunges in through the event horizon never to be seen again and the rest of that material actually spirals out uh, uh, perpendicular to the accretion disk in these very very powerful jets um, and this size is actually incredibly incredibly small uh, compared to the to the humongous size of these galaxies. So you can see how this very tiny little black hole can affect these this very large scales of the galaxies of their own. And this is how this interaction uh, plays out. So how do we actually, how can we, uh, can, can, how can we try to observe this, right? Because this is a very cool simulation, but um, as well as Joe, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an observational astronomer. So I like to observe things. And in and just in April last year, um, we uh, a group of uh, a large like a large collaboration of astronomers all across the world, uh, the world tried to uh, tried to make the first photograph, the first photograph of a black hole, uh, and they used M87 as a test case. So this is just a simulation of what we were expecting to see. So, there is, so they try to observe it in radio wavelengths. Um, let me go back a little bit. So you would see that material is spiraling into the black hole. Uh, and as it spirals down, it's actually emitting a lot of light. And a lot of, light that, a lot of that light can actually come out in radio wavelengths. So very close to where this jet is actually forming. Um, so what this, team, uh, what this team did is, is, is made these simulations right, to see what they would actually look like. So they would expect that if they would look uh, with this event horizon telescope to the core of M87, they would look at, at sort of like a donut shape like fear. And in fact, that's what they did. Uh, this uh, network of I think 11 or 13 telescopes from Hawaii to Greenland, Antarctica, Mexico, US, they, by combining all the different telescopes, combining all the data together at the same time, they could actually mimic 
a telescope the size of the Earth. Because not a single dish that we have currently could have served, uh, could have served this, this uh, very tiny object in the sky. We require a telescope the size of the whole planet to observe it. And this is what they manage and achieve. I think it's a triumph for instrumentation and astronomers and engineers uh, all around the world. Uh, the first image of a black hole. However, this is really neat, right? Okay, we got one, but we know that there are billions and billions of galaxies out there with billions of uh, supermassive black holes of their own. And this technique is just really impossible. We could only do this for very close uh, AGN, a very close uh, supermassive black holes uh, with um, that close by and that they're incredibly big. So how can we try to observe properties like the mass have the size of this disk that forms around it? Um, because unfortunately, uh, if we would like to see this accretion disk, like, like what the picture would look like, we would require a, an array of telescopes a, lot, a thousand times bigger than, the, than our own planet, than planet Earth, in order to be able to, uh, to start to uh, resolve, to try to take an image of this black hole. And if we, if we can just about make it with a telescope the size of our planet, make it one a thousand times bigger seems uh, at least longer than my current job is. So we have to think of another way to do this. Um, so one of the ways, one of the techniques that we actually can do this to see how black holes feed is this technique echo mapping. And it's actually a really simple technique. You've probably heard about this. Um, so the, I just have this really nice animation of how a sonar works, right? So you have this little boat going across the ocean, sending sound waves from the boat to the bottom of the sea, and then the sound waves bounce back. As they, uh, so once they bounce back and get recorded by the boat in the, um, they recorded by the boat, uh, there is all, there is a time delay that it takes all the way from the boat down to the bottom uh, to the bottom floor and then up. And depending on that time delay, that lag between the initial signal and when it came back, because we know the, the speed of sound in water, we can know the distance that that wave traveled. And then, then therefore we can actually start mapping the surface of something that we cannot actually go and measure. We cannot go with a tape measure and measure it, but we can, uh, we can use something that travels a lot faster to, to make us, um, uh, to make the measurement for us. Uh, in astronomy, uh, we cannot use sound, but thankfully there's another wave that we can use, and that is light. Uh, so we can use light to, to do a very, very similar uh, experiment as you do with, uh, with a sonar here on Earth. So let's think about that we have, uh, that are very close to the black hole, you have a, you have a source of light that it's, uh, that it's shining the disk that it's around. So, this, so you have here the black hole and then you have the disk that is funneling material from the outskirts inwards into the black hole. Um, so if we have a source of light very close to the black hole that shines on the, on the accretion disk, we, can, uh, we would expect that some of the light that bounces very close to the black hole, that it would, uh, that bounces back into uh, to us, would bounce first uh, than another, another uh, ray of light that bounces off further away from the disk. Uh, so if we can measure the light coming from different parts of the disk, uh, we could measure the distance between these two sides. So it's a very, it's the same, it's the same technique. So we just need, different waves and measure the time between their arrivals. And if we get that, then we can measure the size of the disks. Um, and what is even cooler is that we, uh, our current knowledge of how these accretion disks work is that, um, that not only that, that not only we would expect different times between the, the light that uh, comes from inner parts from the outer parts, but also that we would expect these lights to come with a different wavelength, with a different color in the electromagnetic spectrum. So, we, so these accretion disks uh, starts very cold in the outside, so they emit at lower energy, so near infrared. And as the material comes in, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and it starts to emit at higher and higher energy, so optical, and as it goes closer to the black hole, the 
in the ultraviolet. And when it's really, really close to the black hole, it starts to emit in X-rays. Um, so then we would expect that this bouncing of these, uh, these echoes from the inner parts of the disk that we would that these echoes would be associated to different wavelengths. So if we observe light coming from the UV, we would expect it to come first than the outer parts of the disk. So this is a very cool prediction uh, that the, that our current accretion theory um, uh, gives us. Um, right. But I'm an, so this is from the theory. But I am a, an, an observational. So how can we actually do this? So and this is where uh, this very neat idea occurred uh, uh, about maybe 10 years ago of using very modest telescopes. So not the very, the, the very big eight meter telescopes that uh, Joe and Rachel were, were showing, but using very modest telescopes, but just, put the, uh, but just using a lot of them. And what you do is you create a global network of telescopes all around the world. So covering the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere from Chile, South Africa, Australia, Texas, Israel, uh, Tibet, Hawaii. So if you can cover the whole, cro the, the whole, uh, whole globe, then you can start monitoring this AGN, these supermassive black holes, and trying to find these uh, variations across different colors to see if you can find these lags. So because we cannot observe some of the wavelengths uh, from the ground, uh, we also need the, need the aid of a space telescope. And in this case, we use a SWIFT observatory, which can observe in X-rays and in ultraviolet. So then we can observe everything that it's emitting all the way from the inner parts of the accretion disk all the way to the outer part. So great, so then what we did is where we went out there, we asked for time, telescope time, and we managed to, uh, to start monitoring this AGN every single day. And this is only possible because you have this global network of telescopes that they are all robotic. So you, so this idea of an astronomer going out there and spending their night in the in the mountain, um, I don't do that anymore. I just I I schedule all my observations uh, via robots. So they every time the of the the uh, um, the supermassive black hole is on top of Australia, it gets an image. When it's on top of South Africa, it gets an image, and Chile, an image, and it just and we just do that every single day for years on end. So far, we've been going three years for this uh, for this object. So this is a relatively close uh, by um, uh, AGN. Uh, it's called Feral Nine. It's 670 million light years away. It's 200 and the mass of the supermassive black hole is 260 million solar masses. So it's it's big, but it's not as big as M87, um, as the as the one that the EHT got a snapshot of. So so we went there and we started taking images every day. And what you're gonna see here, so this is an animation, and this is real data coming from telescopes. So here you have ultraviolet uh, data taken from space, then optical taken from our telescopes and uh, from the ground as well as in near infrared. So every single point that you see there is about every half of a day. Uh, so you can see that this AGN, this active galactic nuclei, are, are very variable. Um, so they varied across the whole wavelength. So how do we actually manage to find these shifts? So how can we say that something is coming from close to the black hole and something that is further away? So I will try to focus around this little pic here. So I'm gonna put a line on top of this uh, of this peak, just as a reference. So we see that uh, that this that the ultraviolet is peaking around this day. But if you start now going to other colors down the way, you will see that that peak starts to go to the right. It starts shifting and shifting and shifting and shifting. So once you get all the way almost to the near infrared, you will see that the peak has moved. It's not at the same spot. And I would just blink between the two of them. So, then, so this sort of confirms uh, our, our suspicion that the disk is working as it should. So in fact, the, so in fact the day, the difference in days between what we observe in the ultraviolet from the near infrared is about eight days. So eight days it takes to, for the light to travel from the inner parts of the disk to the outer parts of the disk. So one way we can show this is just with this very 
nice plot. So this is the only scientific plot I think I have, uh, but it just shows you the relative uh, time difference between all the different bands. So every single color shows the different uh, the difference in time. So all the way from very close in X-rays, so very close to the black hole, uh, to the ultraviolet, it takes around a day. To the optical, it takes about a two or three days. And all the way you're going to the near infrared, you're already at say uh, seven, eight days. And just to put this a little bit into context, how massive this accretion disk is, right? So we know that the light time travel between the sun and the earth is maybe roughly about eight light minutes. Uh, to Pluto, it's about five light hours. The furthest away uh, spacecraft that humans have ever put out there, which has just left the solar system, is about 20 light hours. So if you want to contact Voyager 1, uh, if you send a radio signal to try to see where it is, it takes about 20 hours to get there and then another 20 hours for its signal to cross by. Uh, so that's roughly a day. So that would mean like very, still very close to the, to the black hole. But the size of this disk is about light, eight light days. So eight times even farther away where Voyager 1 is, that's where we are probing in this increasing disk. And the other thing that we can, that we can retrieve from our, uh, from our analysis is how fast this black hole is actually fitting. And it turns out that, uh, that every year this black hole is eating about a tenth of the sun. So in about a decade, uh, almost around the time that I have started my studies in astronomy, this black hole has swallowed a whole Earth uh, worth of material into it. Um, right, so I think with that, I will end. Um, I just wanna, uh, so hopefully I have, uh, I've, I've managed to convince you that studying these black holes, uh, it's, it's relevant and it actually tells us about, about how the universe actually evolves throughout the cosmic times. Um, that we can actually that we can use this incredible like multi mission like using a spacecraft and using a robotic network of telescopes to do very unique and novel experiments um, that we can they cannot otherwise do um, and hopefully I I convince you that we can actually do this in a in, in one of these in one of these sources and now I'm I'm heading a, a new project uh, with this Las Cumbres Observatory with this network of telescopes. Um, for three more years. So we're gonna do it for another eight more targets. So hopefully in the very near future, we will have more information about the sizes of this disc and how rapid are they swallowing. Uh, so there's more information there in the key project. And um, I think I will stop and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, the brilliant talk and really, really interesting. So thank you so much for coming along and sharing that with all of us. Uh, we do have a few questions for you, uh, if that's all right with you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, yeah, so the first question we had come through was talking about the jets uh, and sort of are the jets uh, always symmetrical and are they equal on both sides? Uh, most of the time, yes. Uh, yeah, so of course these jets are time dependent. So uh, or even though they have like a sort of consistent structure, they usually change. Sometimes they are, when we take observations of them, mainly with radio, with radio dishes, we can see small knots, so very like bubbles along these jets. And sometimes they are different in both sides. So it, it's not always that you see the same thing on both two jets, but generally uh, they look the same on both sides. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, second question we had said, following the idea of an array of global telescopes, is it in principle, possible to create a much larger telescope using a bunch of satellites to achieve that thousand Earth size radius? And is this something that's been proposed or talked about? Yes, uh, so at, at least not for, um, so for the, for example, there's already one spacecraft that they use it to extend their network. So there's a radio dish in one of a spacecraft. So when they are, sometimes they are taking images here from Earth, and then the spacecraft is also used as an antenna of that array. So that is already happening. So in principle, this could just be expanded. For example, put some telescopes on the moon and then you will create a, a telescope the size of the earth moon. So I think it's not impossible that in the, probably within our lifetimes, uh, some of these things will happen and that would be a very exciting time to be in. 
that's fascinating. That's really, really interesting. Um, and then, so just just moving on to sort of recent news. Obviously, the recent discovery of the the intermediate uh, black hole. The sort of this is not really helping astronomy with its titling problem. The DW one nine zero five two one intermediate black hole. What does that sort of mean? Is how significant a discovery is that, and how, what does that sort of mean for the work that you're doing? Um, so not a. Uh... So it, it depends. So it's a, so it's a very interesting uh, thing just from the stellar evolution side, um, because one of the things that we know is that it is very difficult to create these intermediate black mass black holes. So we know from just pure stars, these black holes should have maybe 50, maybe 80 uh, solar masses at most. Uh, I think uh, it's very hard for the theory to create black holes to be that massive. But then again, we have we observe these supermassive black holes. So how can we create black holes from stars that they are very small from a hundred, maybe a hundred solar masses? How do we grow them all the way to a thousand or a million or a billion solar masses? So uh, there's been there's been clues here and there of maybe the existence of these what they call missing links, trying to link between the stellar and the big ones. Um, and one of the ways to do it uh, is to merge them, right? So if you have a lot of very small ones, then if they merge, then they can create a bigger one. Uh, but we've never seen that until uh, until last year and until it was, well, the rest of us, until it was actually uh, published uh, a few weeks ago. So we have now observed a physical mechanism to grow from smaller black holes to larger black holes. So then now the question is, can we make this can we have enough of these smaller seeds in order to grow them into a larger ones? And I think that's where uh, incre like, uh, updating and upgrading the new facilities of LIGO, Virgo, there's a new one going uh, in India and I think Japan. Uh, so it will give us a lot more information of how these collisions go. And we'll probably start gonna, um, yeah, so th that's gonna tell us. And then in the next decade, we're gonna have a, a spacecraft, which in my mind is absolutely crazy that someone come up with this idea, but it's, it's an array of satellites, two million kilometers apart, flying in a triangle shape. Uh, and they're shooting lasers at each other. So they work like the interferometers that discovered this, uh, these black holes, but they are flying in space and they will measure the, the small changes of uh, the ripples of space-time created by the collision of supermassive black holes. So that will give us a, a clue up to how to how do these big monsters of black holes actually grow. So we will probably start knowing a lot more in about fifteen to twenty years. Uh, that is that is fascinating, and that that's a future AOT talk for, for yourself or anybody else who's out there because yeah. that sounds amazing. Um, just a couple, couple of extra, just last ones. Um, they were talking a little bit about your uh, the, sort of the data points as well as like how much is being. So, with the echo mapping, how many points are actively being recorded or logged, and how much data are you actually processing when you're doing this? Uh, I should probably have those numbers uh, at hand, um, but I do have. It's so it's a few terabytes of data. So uh, so we generate. So every time it goes through one of the telescopes. It takes uh, eight filters and it takes a couple of snatches. So it takes 16 images every time it goes. And it's a few, like maybe 20, 20 megabytes each picture. So if someone can do a quick calculation of 20 megabytes times 16 times, times 365 days, it will give you an idea of how much data we're generating per object. So yeah, so it, it, it grows really quickly. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can imagine the storage must get, it must get squeezed at some point. <laughs> yes, yes, and then for that, then it's a lot of processing of the data, so that generates even more data. Um, yes, uh, yeah, but in the end, right, I mean, it's, it, it's always crazy that at the end, like, what I've shown, it, I've shown in that little video, it's just terabytes of data, just compressed, uh, and the power of data analysis to try to compress all that information into a single plot, but that represents a year of, uh, of following up, of robots working out the schedule to observe everything, engineers making that everything works together so that we can create these awesome light curves of 
things that are so far away and let us know a lot about them. Oh, fantastic. And final question for you was just about your future projects, about the LCO project. So you said you were looking to, to, to focus on three years on eight different objects. Is that right? Yes. How far away are these objects? Like, are they all sort of fairly clustered or are they spread apart? So they're so they are spread apart, uh, but they are all very nearby um, objects. So the thing is, we're working with one meter telescopes. Even though it's bigger than your conventional one that you may have on your backyard, it's still very small for astronomical uh, purposes. So we cannot really go to very far away uh, AGN, very far away quasars. Uh, we just don't net, we do not get the quality of the data that we need to do these experiments. So what we try to do is try to make a very good sample of very close by and very bright sources. And then maybe in the future, uh, there's gonna be surveys, for example, the Vera Rubin uh, telescope survey uh, in Chile, which is gonna be observing the full Southern sky, uh, I think once every two or three days. So that is gonna give us light curves of tens of thousands of these quasars. So the whole idea is to, um, to get a to know really well how uh, how these things work from a very small good sample and then use that knowledge to then use these other uh, like big larger surveys where it will give us fainter targets so therefore further away so maybe we can make a history of how these black holes grow throughout cosmic time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Juan. And thank you so much for, for coming on. It's a really brilliant talk and we no, really appreciate thanks. you coming along. Thanks for inviting. <laughs> okay, so uh, that almost completes our evening. But before we finish, uh, I'd like just to hand back to our resident games master to Rachel with the results of our quiz. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who took part in our quiz tonight. Um, I understand I made an error in my code and two of you managed to get more than eight questions right out of eight. So congratulations for breaking the laws of physics and mathematics. Um, I will look into what's wrong with my code. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who um, participated. We're going to quickly run through the answers and then I'll announce the winner. So question one, this telescope facility is the Very Large Telescope. Um, most rubbish name for a really cool observatory. Um, in April 2019, we all saw this image in the news and in the second talk, um, we got its name, it says M87. Um, this image, the purple one of the Whirlpool Galaxy, is seen in the X-ray. Um, the clue there is that you can see lots of point sources. These are mostly X-ray binaries, so these will be um, two very compact sources that are orbiting each other very, very fast, heating up a lot of material or possibly some black holes. Um, the active galactic nuclei, um, we did learn this one in the first talk, these are powered by supermassive black holes. All the other things do happen, um, but they're not the cause of active galactic nuclei. Um, the wavelengths observed by ALMA, best answer on this list is the radio. Question six, the missing link between stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes, very boringly named intermediate mass black holes, um, one of which was possibly discovered earlier this year. The um, wavelength that must be observed from space, so there are optical near-infrared telescopes in space, um, but far infrared is the one that you can't do from the ground as blocked by the atmosphere, and that was the Herschel Space Telescope, Herschel Space Observatory, excuse me, um, if you happen to recognize that. Question eight, the supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way is Sagittarius A star. Doesn't look like that with the naked eye. Um, and thank you. So there were three people who managed to score eight out of eight. Um, the winner um, with the, the score that included speed in its weighting um, was Will from Geneva with a high score of 6,467. And congratulations, Will. Um, but the highest scorer who gave me an email address and therefore wins the prize is Chris from Southampton, um, also scored eight out of eight with a score of 5,767. Um, I will be in touch by email to get your address and that prize will wing its way over to you. Um, also, I said I wasn't going to shame anyone for being low scored, but apparently I have a reputation for bullying Maddie when I run quizzes. So Maddie only came sixth. 
Paul show. Actually a pretty amazing show for someone who has no background in astronomy, so well done. Thank you again to everyone who took part. We will use all the feedback to improve the system and hopefully be back at a future astronomy on tap. Um, so back to you, John. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, and just a huge thanks uh, to Joe and Juan uh, for their talks tonight. Uh, both really fascinating talks and really interesting. We've run over time a little bit just because it's so much fascinating stuff to sort of to squeeze into our IoT talk, but I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, I hope everybody's uh, enjoyed watching from home. Obviously, we hope we're back in the pub sooner rather than later, bringing you some live events. But for now, I think this is a great way to uh, to keep everybody together and to bring some really interesting stuff while everybody's sort of stuck at home in the computers. Um, just a reminder to say that we will be back again in October, Tuesday, October the 13th will be our next event. So please do join us again on YouTube when we'll have some further talks uh, and, and fantastic games with, with prizes as well that aren't just posters. It's a first for us uh, at AOT Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, so please do. And if you did enjoy tonight, uh, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, please like and subscribe the video. Uh, and then, of course, please do follow us on Twitter at AOT underscore EDI as well. Uh, and so for now, uh, I'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you again, hopefully, uh, to drink in the universe on October the 13th. <laughs>